Praise the Lord. Praise the God. Um, we're here together. And uh, at times like this, toward the end of the year, um, people actually you know, begin to care about people. You know, this is an interesting thing about it. You know, I'm like, we should do this all year. It's always been my enigma, isn't it? Um, I didn't grow up in the church, so forgive me. I did not grow up in the church. So, um, you know, when I, I, I used to like, why, why do Christians do this all, all year round? You know, we should take care of each other year round. Uh, but in a sense, our society is built like that. And, and, and it's okay. I mean, we, I'd rather have that than none at all. And uh, at times like this, there's always needs that come up. And we always are told toward the end of the year, which is, it's okay. Um, we like to do it the whole year round, but... That's just the way. That's just the way it is. Uh, so we have two requests that we want to fulfill, and there's two schools, uh, Kimbark being one of them, and the other one. Julie, you got to help me. What school is that? Arbita. Arbita. That's right, where she works at. And there are about 40 kids in her school, and I don't know how many kids in our, and same amount. Okay, that have nothing. They have nothing, and uh, we want to be as believers show the love of Christ. And if you would like to help with these kids in donating if something uh, of a gift or some kind gesture toward them, uh, please see Julie. She has an overwhelming task. There's 40, and there's only one of her. So uh, you can see the ratio there. It's very much needed. And also see Roy for the Kimbark Elementary School that we have here in our community. So what, do you want to shine your light this is a time, right? Now, we should do it year-round. Don't get me wrong. I'm happy for the uh, end of the year and the Christmas and nativity. That's wonderful. But let's not forget the kindness that the Lord Jesus had in May, in June, July, August, right? But we want to do this uh, at a time where there's a great need. So when we're in form of a need, uh, I'm sure CCOD, you guys have been awesome. Every need that has ever come up has always been met through you, the Lord through you, and that's the way the Lord operates. He gives us certain resources to appropriate it to those who have not. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 3 tells us that. So see, Julie, 40 kids. We have about 40 in Kimbark. We want to fulfill the needs. So let's give some wonderful help the way we know how to do it here in this fellowship to help them and, 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 and bring Christ into their lives. Many of them know about Christ in a sense of how I knew about Christ when I was a young kid. Uh, but I didn't know the gospel. I didn't know him personally. And that's our endeavor. And anything that we do is we bring people closer to Christ. And those who are in Christ, we strengthen them to commit themselves to Christ even more. So that is that. So I hope I did okay on those two things. I forgot. So uh, lots going on today. And uh, we do have prayer. And we do have uh, the scriptures to go through. So let's get into God's word and let God's word into you. So that's how it works. We get into it. It gets into us. So let's pray. Lord, please be with us, Lord God, in the power and strength of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we commit ourselves to you more every day. It's a step. It's an inch. It's a step closer to your son. Uh, Lord, until he returns, we won't be be perfected yet. We're not perfected yet until he comes. But until he comes, Lord God, we endeavor to imitate him and walk in his ways. As Paul the Apostle said, to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Lord, help us to imitate you and help others, Lord God. Look at our lives and that they will be able to imitate Christ by seeing our lives being like Christ. Lord, we commit this time to you, your word, your spirit, prayer, the fellowship of the saints. Lord, what else do we need? We need, Lord, to speak to us and draw us closer by the power of your spirit, closer to your son. Lord, these words are in black and white. Help them to be internalized and let them be, as as John says, the word made flesh. Help these words become flesh in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And a few, uh, maybe next week, we'll start a couple of little sections that we want to bring about the nativity. As uh, churches talk about the nativity during this time, we like to bring our version of the nativity. We talk about verses that, you know, Isaiah 7, Isaiah, uh, you know, Micah 5, 2, those are all important scriptures. Uh, but there's so much to be said about the coming of Jesus. We want to emphasize those things over the next couple of weeks. Why Jesus came. Why Jesus came. Today, though, is do you believe this? Do you believe this? And it's an amazing chapter because um, I had no idea how to teach it. Because I struggled with it. I thought, well, maybe we could do it this way. We could do it that way. Maybe we'll just go verse by verse through every single you know, verse, and that might take two weeks, but it's just so rich 
and I don't want you to miss it. So I really struggle on the approach. So we'll try a little bit different. We're going to give you what the chapter is about as a whole, and then we're going to see how individuals within the chapter behave, what it meant for those individuals in the chapter, including us. So there are the sisters, there are the disciples, there is the religious leaders, there are the religious leaders, and then there's us. Because you can't have a Bible study without direct application at the end. But we first have to know what it meant. What did it mean? And so chapter 11, you heard Frank uh, read it. That was wonderful. The incident here comes after the teaching of Jesus about being the good shepherd. So you can't divorce it from those two things. Being the good shepherd, you talk about following Jesus. Well, the sheep hear my voice and they follow. It's, remember, it's about hearing the voice of Jesus through his word and it's following and executing God's word in action. So uh, it's listening the good, to the good shepherd and following him. Those are the two things that every believer needs to have. In fact, that is the emblematic sign of a disciple. It's hearing his voice and following him. You know, so it's the same thing that James would say. Don't be hearers only, but doers as well. So we have to follow him. And it's also the time where Jesus talked about his I am statements. And he's going to talk about another I am statement pretty soon in which he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And this is the, the great sign that's going to appear to us here. Remember, uh, John speaks about miracles, but he calls them signs. And this ultimate sign is the resurrection. There's no, uh, the, 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 there's no more signs after this. This is the, the, the final sign that Jesus gives in terms of his miracles. And the ultimate one is the resurrection, which, of course, points to his own and our own resurrection. And it, it occurred in a place called Bethany. It occurred in a place called Bethany. And it involved people that John has not talked about. As you see here, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. Well, if you just read the book of John, you have no idea who they are. You have to read the other Gospels to find out who they are because John didn't write too many details about them, but he includes this one chapter that is so unique. right? So in order for you to know who they are, you have to go to the other accounts, especially the book of Luke, in which Luke tells us that it was at their house where Jesus spent a lot of time. In fact, this was Jesus' home away from home. He had no closest, uh, no closer relationship with anyone except his disciples than Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they lived in Bethany, and Bethany is an interesting place. It's actually, you can go there today. It's a village right over the Mount of Olives, on the east side of the Mount of Olives. You just go up the Mount of Olives from the Temple Mount. You go over the top of the Mount of Olives, and you get to the east side of it. And guess what you find? A bunch of little villages. Well, it's still there. It's not called Bethany in that way anymore, but it's still there where Jesus would have been living. He spent quite a bit of time there. So whenever Jesus went down to Jerusalem, he stayed at the house of Lazarus. He would meet with his disciples, and they all stayed together. Sort of a big getaway, you know, from you know, the boys from the north had to go down to the south, and they stayed at Lazarus' house. And so Jesus was there, and in this place, he had good friends, those three, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they loved each other. Look what it says in verse 5. Uh, it says, Jesus loved Martha and, his, and her sisters, um, Love Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That would have been Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So Jesus had tremendous love for them. Look at verse 11. This he said after he said to them, Our friend Lazarus had fallen asleep. He called them his friend. Called them his friend. These were not you know, distant cousins type stuff. This was very close people. Remember Jesus? Uh, his family didn't like him. His family rejected him. Who accepted those who believed in him, accepted him. But that family was a special family. That family was a special family. And so it takes place not in Jerusalem, where all the religious leaders and all the wealth and all the pomp of the temple was located. It locate, it's located in Bethany, a little tiny village with a tiny family, an insignificant place with insignificant people in terms of the high priest, the, you know, the temple priest, you know, Herod. It didn't occur with the, with the high-class people, with the wealthy people. This occasion, Jesus was with the low, with the poor, with the people that were insignificant. That always tells you something about Jesus, right? He always works among those who are humble of heart, willing to follow him, not the rich, not the wealthy, not the powerful, but the simple, what the world calls the foolish things. And God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. So this is the kind of place where God was working and was operating. Now, something happened, though. 
Lazarus was ill. He was ill and he was dying and nobody can help except Jesus, right? And it's interesting that it says here, uh, it tells you who they were in verse 2. Mary anointed the feet of Jesus with the ointment. At one point when Jesus was at their house, Mary had anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So remember that story in the book of uh, in Luke? And Lazarus was also, was also there, but now he was sick. And the sickness was, was a very grave sickness. It was unto death. He was going to die. Although Jesus said this was going to be something God is going to use. Jesus never said he wasn't going to die. He just said it's something that God is going to use. Even if he dies, it's something God will use. Now, he stayed there for two days, two days longer. And this brings a great question, right? A great question of why did Jesus wait so long? This is one of those chapters that puzzles a lot of people. But we know that he loved them, so his love wasn't connected with his delay necessarily. You know, some people would interpret his delay as, well, he doesn't love them. He says he loves them, but he delays. Well, it's not the love that we would think, you know, run out. And as soon as you hear something, you run out and find out what's going on. Jesus did things very, very specifically. And there's a reason why he did it. And so they called for Jesus. Look what it says here. When Jesus heard this, right, the, uh, the sister sent word to him, behold, the one whom you love is sick. Now they... This is interesting. They knew where Jesus was. He wasn't in Bethany. He wasn't in Jerusalem. Um, He could have been outside, just on the east side of the Jordan in the wilderness. He could have been in Galilee. We don't know where he was, but all we know is that they found him. They found Jesus. So the relationship what they had was very interesting. They they sort of knew where Jesus was going. They kind of have this relationship that, you know, oh, I know where Jesus is going to be. Jesus is always there. I know where he's at. And so this kind of teaches us a little bit something about, just on a little side note here, whenever trouble hits your home, whenever trouble hits your home, and it's bound to happen, make no mistake about it, we live in a fallen world, it's going to happen, just know where Jesus is. That's the main thing in your life, know where Jesus is. Where can you find Jesus? Well, hopefully you're really close to him, just like Mary and Martha knew where he was. You know, can you imagine all of Israel? Where is Jesus? They knew. They knew where to send the guy because they knew Jesus really well. You know, do you know Jesus that well, that wherever situation strikes your home, you know where to find Jesus? That's, that's, that's a really important part um, of our relationship with him. Where is he? A lot of people, you know, they, uh, fear strikes home, calamity strikes the home, and they don't know what to do. Find Jesus. And all they know is that they need to get Jesus quickly. Come quickly, Jesus, the one whom you love is sick. And Jesus heard it and deliberately For two days, he delays. We'll talk about that. And when he gets to the place where um, Bethany, he gets to Bethany, Martha meets him. And it says that Martha says, Lord, if you were here, if you were only here, Lazarus would not have died. Now, he got there four days after he'd been dead. So that means that he delayed two days, then the travel time. By the time he gets to Bethany, four days have happened since he died. And he is dead, and later on it tells us that it's a stench of death. If you open the grave, he stinks. He stinks already. So Jesus comes, gets this from Martha, if you were only here, and he sends a message to Mary that the one who, Jesus, whom she loved, she loved to hear Jesus, um, speaks the words of comfort to her. Come, come and see me. And Jesus then weeps, and then he groans, right? And then he prays. And the amazing thing is he speaks those words, and he says, Lazarus, come forth, right? And he, the most wonderful, wonderful thing you could ever hear is the resurrection. Out of the tomb, out of the grave comes Lazarus, all wrapped up. It's amazing. Just by the words of Jesus, after weeping and groaning and crying, he calls forth Lazarus, and he comes forth, And many people believe in Christ. Many people do. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, came to the same meeting, and they hated him for this. So people believe in Christ after this miracle, and the Pharisees hated Jesus for this miracle, which is an interesting thing, that in Jerusalem, after this resurrection miracle, they determined to kill Jesus. That's it. We had enough of this man. We're going to kill him. We're going to put a hit on him, and that's it. He can't go on any further. This is enough. 
and even Caiaphas, the, great, the, the high priest that they had, he even prophesied that Jesus would have to die for the nation. That was an interesting thing. And, um, and then Jesus leaves that area, and he goes to an isolated area in Ephraim. So the question is always this. Why did Jesus deliberately delay two days? All right? So he knows he is going to die. He tells them plainly he is going to die. And his sisters are concerned. Where's Jesus? Day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. Not funeral comes. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Finally, Jesus shows up. And they feel, Mary especially, feels like the Lord lets them, let them down. The Lord let them down. I called for you. Jesus, you're powerful. You can do anything. And you let us down. I'm going to show hands, but maybe you want to show us hands. How many have ever felt like that? Let the Lord let you down. All right. There's a lot more uh, like me than I, than, than I thought, or at least more confessions today, right? Sometimes we can't get anything out of this group right here, and they don't say anything. You know, this group's like, yeah, Lord, repent. I believe that this is, we did this wrong. All right, Susie, amen. All right. Now, the messenger comes, the messenger comes to Jesus, and Jesus is told, you know, he's going to die. And, and Jesus automatically, he knows he has a special relationship with him, but he receives a message. Now, if you got a message today that your loved one, whoever that may be, was sick unto death, you would immediately, I would see you, nothing but the back of your pants, and you would head out that door, and, and, and you would be, obviously, that's the right thing to do, right? You would think. As soon as you hear something, you out that door, Nothing said. There's nothing else on your mind but to get to that person that's about to die. But Jesus didn't do that. He actually delays it. Two more days, right? And when he arrives, he is late. Why did he wait? Why didn't he go at once? Well, we know he loved them, right? Verse 11, uh, sorry, verse 3, verse 5. He loved them, and he had a great compassion for them. So Jesus is not heartless in this situation. He, he's not heartless. You cry for help. God, please help. And the Lord delays. It's happened. It's happened to a lot of believers. Whether they're in pain, whether they're family issues, whether they have financial issues, the Lord delays, but there's a reason for it. Look at verse 21. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, right? If you had been here, uh, he would not have died. Verse 27. Verse 27. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, even he who, comes, uh, he who comes into the world. So she believed the right things about Christ. Verse 32, therefore, when Mary came to Jesus, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is true in a lot of cases. Believers know the power of God. She, they knew the power of Jesus. He had power. They knew the story of Jairus' daughter. They knew the story of the widow's son in Nain, where Jesus had resurrected people. But they, it came to the point, and this is where their faith had to be challenged, right? It came to the point where they thought there's a place where Jesus cannot do anything more. There's a place in life where Jesus is helpless when it gets to this point. This is what they thought about Jesus. Jesus, you could do anything. Only if you had been here. You see the point? Once you hit death, once you hit four days, Jesus, you're out of your league. Once you, I know you could do all these miracles. I mean, the widow's son of Nain, that was a funeral, and you raised him from the dead. Uh, Jairus' daughter was dead just recently, and you rose her from the dead. He's been dead four days. I think that's too much. I think that's too long. And so there's a place where Jesus can't do much because it's too late. That's what they're saying, right? They thought their situations beyond the power of Christ and his purpose, though, in this situation is to show them that there is no situation beyond him. That's one of the reasons he delays. That although they knew him, they really didn't know him. You see the point? Yeah. You see, you know Christ and I know Christ, but there's a situation in your life where he will come through in your life where you will know him. And you'll come and tell me, you know, I thought I knew him, but I know him now. We might know him as Savior and Lord, Redeemer, right? All those wonderful things. But when the Lord delivers you from something, then you know him Amen. intimately. Yes. When, when you have suffered for the Lord and he delivers you, it's something more. It's something that even Adam knew. Right? Adam never knew him as Savior and Lord. You know, he knew him as God and Creator. But you can know him even more than what Adam knew him, right? Because he will come through in your life. Now, the question is, will he? 
You see, that's the battle. That's what we named the title today. Do you believe this? Because you're going to be faced with those situations. When Jesus heard of the illness, he says in verse 4, go back to it. The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified or magnified, right? When Jesus heard of the illness, he says, this is not unto death. Now, it doesn't mean he, didn't, he wasn't going to die. It meant that he wasn't going to experience the ultimate death that is going to come when we don't know the Lord and we're not going to go on living. Of course, believers go on living. We'll talk about that in a moment. He is not going to remain dead is what Jesus is saying. This sickness is not going to keep him dead. So Lazarus' sickness is all for the purposes of God. This is the hard thing to, for us to know. God is going to use this sickness, this horrible thing that has happened for his purposes and his glory, and it will lead to this, the exaltation and glorification of Jesus, and it will be magnified, and it will lead to forever known. Now, this chapter is in the eternal word of God. Everybody knows this. Every believer ought to know this, that Jesus has power over the resurrection. If, if Lazarus had not died, you never would have experienced that. If Lazarus would not have died, they would never would have known Christ the way they came to know Christ. And so situations in our lives are, are these things that God uses, and they're painful, and they're horrible. And you're going to see that Jesus is not insymp- unsympathetic toward them. He's not unsympathetic. He actually cries with them. He actually mourns with them because he loved them, because he loved them. Now, in verses 11 through 15, you're going to read the whole thing, but he... Uh, he tells them, he clarifies these things to his disciples. Where do I have that here? There it is. He clarifies these things with his disciples. He said, Jesus said, after he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him up. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, then he will recover. The disciples said to him, uh, sorry, verse 13, uh, Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So they're misunderstanding what Jesus is saying. Verse 14, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. See, Jesus knew already that he was going to die. It wasn't a surprise when he showed up uh, at Bethany. Verse 15, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. You see that? Jesus is saying that there's something in this miracle that is going to bring people closer to Jesus. Jesus knew he was going to die. Jesus said he was asleep. And the idea here confuses people, so I clarify. The word sleep for believers only. It's only for believers, only for Christians. The Bible uses it only for believers. It is basically a separation that is temporary. A temporary separation from your body and your spirit. That is what happens to believers. A temporary separation where to be absent from this body is to be present with Christ, the Bible says, right? That is what the word means, sleep. Now, why does it use sleep? Now, there are are some false teachings that are called soul sleep and things like that. And uh, it's 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 an error of how they teach it. Because what they're saying is people fall asleep and you're not conscious. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says you have a conscious, conscious relationship with the Lord even when you're dead. Even when you're dead, a believer has a conscious relationship with the Lord. It is separated from the physical body, absolutely true, but you're not unconscious. You're not unconscious. And this is where the false teaching of soul sleep comes in because people say, well, you just fall asleep and you wake up again. Well, yes, you wake up again in this world, (laughs) but you are still conscious in the next world, right? This is where the separation comes in. You're separated from your physical body for just a moment, however that long is, you know? Because there's no time at all, it may not feel like a long time in eternity, right? But particular circumstances, right, where the people are alive, right, there's a person who's alive and then they die, they stop being active in this world, but they go on being active in the next world. That's all it means for the believer, right? uh, Falling asleep. This is what the Bible means by falling asleep. You're active in this world, you fall asleep. You are conscious still in the next world, right? Being with the Lord. You're not active in this world. You're active in the next world. At the resurrection, your body and spirit meet again. It's called the resurrection. And now you are with the Lord and with each other, active in both the physical world and the spiritual world. 
because we'll have a glorified body. Is that everybody all right with that? Okay. Uh, some people get confused on it. Some people, if you heard it enough times, you'll be like, I already know this, so sorry about that. But if you didn't know, then that might help you. Why the Bible uses the word sleep for the believer only. Now, two days can be seen like a long time, right? And Jesus is not there. And it seems like the stench of death was going to be overwhelming. They even tell Jesus, Lord, don't go in the tomb. That the one whom you love stinks for days. Now, this is going to be a great display of his power. This is what we're going to get into now. Uh, let's look at the people's reactions. Let's look at the sisters first. Mary and Martha. Let's look at Martha first. Verse 21 and 22. Same chapter. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my mother would have died, even though I know that whatever you ask God, he will give it to you. All right? Martha's faith had, she had faith. She was a believer. That if Jesus was there, my brother would not have died. I know you're the son of God. I know you're able to do this. But she couldn't quite stretch her faith to believe that once death sets in, can Jesus still do it? You know, I think there's a lot of us that think that way, maybe inadvertently. We know Jesus is powerful. We know Jesus is good. And as long as I'm, it's, it's, this is happening, I know God can do it. Once that person goes this way, Lord, I don't know if you can. <laughs> once that person crosses that threshold, once that circumstance goes so far, Lord, I don't know, this might be too hard for you. They, she could not believe that Jesus could raise him from the dead at that moment. She could believe that Jesus, will rise, uh, that Jesus can raise him again. Look what it says in verse 23. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again at the resurrection in the last days. Jesus, I know this. We all are. <laughs> you know, some consolation, right? We all are. Yes, that's true. We're all going to be resurrected. But Jesus, do you realize you should have resur- you should have kept him from dying at the beginning? Now that he's dead, he's too far gone. He's too far gone for you. Martha had the faith that he could do it, but once death sets in, she couldn't stretch that far. And this is what God wanted for her. She was hoping... Jesus could get there on time, but once Jesus couldn't, then it's too hard. It's too hard for the Lord. Everything inside of her wanted, everything inside of her wanted him to say, your brother's going to rise again right now. But Jesus didn't say that. It's almost like if Jesus is drawing more faith out of her. Do you believe he's going to do it? Well, I want you to say it right now. <laughs> no, he will rise again. But is he going to rise again right now? Well, let's see. Do you have the faith to believe that I could do it? See, this is what Jesus was in relationship with him. These are believers. These are not unbelievers. The unbeliever, for them, the death is a tragedy. For the believer, it's not a tragedy. And this is an important thing that Jesus is teaching here this, uh, regarding death. For the believer, death is life if you can think about this. Because look what it says in verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now, it doesn't end there. And everyone who believes, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And what is Jesus saying here? He's saying that for the believer, death goes on to life. It is never the end. It is never a tragedy. For the Christian, for the born-again believer, death is not the end. For the unbeliever, it is absolutely the end of this world, of the best thing that they could have. In fact, they only have one life. This is where the tragedy comes in. For the unbeliever, it's a tragedy. Why? This is all. This is all they will get. The unbeliever wants to hold on to everything in this world. They want to hold on to their football, to their games, to their money, to their whatever they can. Why? Because this is all there is. And that's why they fight so hard to keep it. And they don't want to talk about them losing it because it is all that they have. And they do everything they can to hold on to it. The unbeliever, when they die, they will never be able to touch their sports, their leisures, their wealth, their power, their position, anything that they enjoy. And they have a fearful looking ahead of a judgment that's to come. And this is what the Bible speaks about, that they're, looking for, they're fearful of the judgment to come. In the conscience of men, there's a fearfulness of the judgment that will come to all those who are godless, those who have sinned, those who are godless. And this is their greatest tragedy. 
Do you realize that's why many today in our world are pushing this idea of immortality through transhumanism? They will do everything they can to keep themselves alive. They will do and even merge themselves with machines to keep their conscious alive and artificial intelligence so they can keep on living so they will never have to die consciously. But it'll never work the way they think it's going to work. The, 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 the heart of the matter is they are going to be, they are going to be living forever, but it's going to be living forever in judgment. Because of sin, because of godlessness, the Bible speaks of the terrible judgment of hell. But transhumanism wants to avoid all that. So this whole idea of transsexuality and, and trans this and get the kids, tra- it's all a ploy to try to get to the main thing, transhumanism. Notice how it's moved from homosexuality to transsexuality, right? To now, what do they talk about more than anything else? AI, artificial intelligence, you know, becoming less human and merging yourself with... Uh, with uh, uh, machine and computers. Why? Because you need to live forever. The goal of humanity, in this sense, is to live forever without Christ. Now, the Bible has made it clear the only way you can live immortal is through the gospel. The only way to have immortality in this, in this world, the only way to have immortality in the next world is through the gospel of Jesus. That's it. Well, they don't want that. So for the believer, it's not a tragedy. It is not a tragedy because we have the resurrection. Jesus is our resurrection. We die in this world. We have the promise of life. This is why it's not a tragedy. We have the promise of life. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And we have certainly, we have certainly this hope, right? And the idea of hope is a certainty that is not yet in your hands. That's the idea of hope. You can die today and have the promise of resurrection and eternal life. Do you have it right now? Well, you can't physically see it, but it's in you, right? And you have the word of God and the promises of God that you you will have it. You will have it. And Jesus said, whoever continues to believe in me, that's the word there, continues to believe in me, though he die, he will live. And you know if a believer has passed away, you can say that about this person. If a believer has passed away, you can say that. Even though they died in this world, they live. See, this is why it's not the end. You go on living. All it is is sleep. Did everybody fall asleep last night? Okay, you've slept good, some of us, maybe? Okay, Did, was anybody afraid of sleep last night? No, we welcomed them. We were so tired, and whatever you did, you were so tired. You were like, I'm going to go down, and, and you know, and, and if you were really, you know, you know, pretty strategy in your life, you probably took a nap before then, so you can actually sleep better at night, right? So none of us, none of us are afraid of a good nap, right, Frank? None of us are afraid of a good nap. Therefore... None of us should be afraid of death as a believer. If you're an unbeliever, it is the most horrifying thing you're ever going to have. And I've done funerals for unbelievers. It is the most difficult thing to do because you have to bear the truth. You have to bear the truth of the reality. Now, everybody wants to hear nice things, yeah, but everybody wants to hear the truth. right? But the reality is, as a believer, you have no fear in death. Why? Because you're going to live again. It's just a temporary separation. Now, it's tragic. Yes, it could be terrible, sadness, absolutely. But Jesus says, you will not experience death in the way death is experienced by unbelievers. We're only temporarily separated from our bodies, temporarily separated from our loved ones. Is it painful? Yes, but we will be reunited in Christ at the resurrection. Right Now, There is no disconnect. When we talk about from conscious, there's no disconnect from conscious. Do you believe this, says Jesus in verse 26? Do you believe this? Do you believe that though you die, you are going to live again? Martha, do you believe that I can can do this? Because if you believe I can do this, then I can raise your your, your brother really easy because I'm going to do something even greater. I'm going to resurrect everybody when he comes. He is going to resurrect everybody. But... Verse 27 says this. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. She believed it. She believed you're the Messiah, but she had to learn something unique about this. It is not a tragedy, Martha. It is not a tragedy. Your brother dying, he'll go on living. He'll go on living. But do you believe I could do this? Do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life? Now, what about Mary? What about Mary? 
She's completely crushed by sorrow. Notice she doesn't even come out to see Jesus yet. She can be very touched by these circumstances. You know, and we can do too. Somebody dies in your family, you're touched by this in a very unique way. And there's a lot of occasions where people are just going to hiding. They isolate themselves because of the problem. And that is true. And that is true of Mary. There was an occasion where Jesus taught at her home. And what did she do? She sat there and she was thrilled about what Jesus said. She was so thrilled about what Jesus said. She, you know, Martha even got mad at her because she was fixing all the stuff for dinner and setting up, you know, you got a quick, quick, you know, cook for 12 guys and plus Jesus and Lazarus and all these people that came. And Mary just wanted to have a Bible study, right? And she just wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. She was enthralled. Mary, Mary was uh, not working hard and Martha says, what, you know, what, what's up with her? And Jesus says, leave her alone. This part will not be taken away from her. This is an important thing. The priority is always Christ, right? And verse 28 says this. When she said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher, meaning Jesus, is here and is calling for you. Now, this is very sweet. When you're in bereavement, I don't know if you ever experienced that. You know, maybe you have people that died in your family, maybe somebody close. When you're in bereavement and brokenness, it seems like nobody cares for you. Right? You might get calls here and there, but nobody really knows the, the depth of your sorrow. And it seems like no one can do anything for you. You're just in a very deep sorrow. Who calls for her? Jesus. When you're in that circumstances, Jesus always calls you. He always calls you. When you're in that situation, Jesus will always call out to you. Why? Because he wants you to know that he still cares. Because the difficulty when you're in bereavement is you don't think anybody cares. Yeah, people say hi to you, and then they, you know, but do you really know? Right? You know, that's how we feel, right? Do you really know how I feel? And it seems like nobody does, but Jesus does. And he calls for her, and being in a home, being away, being isolated, despite everything else, Jesus still calls her. In verse 32, she comes to him. Mary came to Jesus. When she saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She doesn't bring a reproach to Christ. She doesn't attack Christ. She doesn't, you know, blame him for it. She just falls at his feet, sheds her tears, and with bitter tears. These are deep tears. By the way, the Bible never says a believer should be fake about sorrow. The Bible never says that, right? I know as Christians we're to have joy, right? We're to have peace. We're to have all these things. But have you ever felt, maybe, you know, against a show of hands, right? Have you ever felt maybe the fact that you have been so broken and so sorrow and so bereaved by all this that you almost feel guilty because you're like, maybe I should have joy. Maybe other Christians, meaning well, have told you, why don't you have joy? Why don't you have peace, man? Don't you trust Jesus? And you just can't. Nothing makes sense. You can't read the Bible. You can't pray. Everything you think is sorrow and more headaches and more heartache, right? Anybody been there? Right? Anybody been there, right? And it just seems like you're just so you're almost guilty, Maybe I should be happy in praising God, but I don't feel like it. She comes and she has tears. Notice Jesus doesn't rebuke her tears. What's wrong with you? Come on, have peace. Just confess it. Just be nothing. Jesus says, actually, he's going to weep with her. She has no bitter tears, but the difference of the unbeliever is this. The unbeliever, what do they do when they have bereavement? Because it hits everyone. By the way, it's not, it's not just the Christian or not for just the unbeliever. It hits all of us. Deep sorrow, deep, deep things. The unbeliever has to do it alone. The unbeliever has to do it alone, and that's why it turns into bitterness, because nobody understands them, and, right, and, and true, nobody understands the sorrow. Nobody can understand the depth of what that pain is like, and so the unbeliever has only one, just himself, to deal with it. And, it, and normally you're trying to numb it. Some people turn to alcohol or drugs or whatever, maybe just to numb it. And they can't deal with the loneliness, so it turns to bitterness. They begin to blame other people. What does the believer have? What does the believer have? Where does she go? She goes to Jesus. This is the great difference. You go to Christ, tears. Notice tears. Not just, not, not, not just fake uh, happy. You, know? you can come to Christ with tears. And he's not going to rebuke you. He wants you to come with those tears and, the, and that pain. Why? Because he cares for us. Who called her? 
Jesus did. Verse 28, he says, the, the teacher wants to talk to you. The Lord wants to talk to you. You know, when you're in those situations, don't, don't ever just shut yourself down. Talk to Jesus first. Amen. Bear your tears. He wants those tears, right? He keeps them in a bottle, the psalmist says. That's how faith behaves, by the way. Faith and pain behave that way because we don't come around pretending that everything's okay. No, not everything is fine. We don't have the arrogance of self-confidence. I'm good, brother. Don't come around. I'm all right. And inside, we're like dying, right? These tears in the presence of Christ are the best thing you could ever have. So don't let anybody guilt you into thinking like, well, you're not a real Christian because you're not, you're not happy today. Man, if you knew what I went through, yeah, you wouldn't be happy either. But only Christ knows, right? Only Christ knows. And in fact, uh, he's able to get us through. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Now this is. By the way, four teachings you can get out of this, this one verse, Jesus wept. So this is for if you want to teach a Bible study, you can do four points. A little help. If you want to do a four points on that one verse. The shortest verse in the Bible, you can draw four things out of that, and you can teach about an hour and a half. Yeah, that's, that, was, that would be my fault, for an hour and a half. But you can draw four points from just that one statement. Why? Jesus truly was man. Jesus was not ashamed to cry in the, in, in the midst of despair and problems. He's our teacher. He's teaching us that this is something believers ought to do when they face with sorrow. But remember, sorrow, never despair. Despair is when you have nobody. Despair is when you have nobody to talk to, nobody to go to. You're complete, bitter, and isolated. Jesus doesn't want you to do that. This is why the world turns like that. But we have a great high priest who is able to commune with us in our weaknesses and is able to sympathize with us and is able to cover with us and is able to deal with us and is able to comfort us, it says here. Right? Jesus is our comforter. He's able to comfort you. He wasn't there just going like, you know, Mary, you just need to have a stiff upper lip. You need to get things right here. Right? Come to hear my teaching and you'll get it right. No, there's no time for that. What did Jesus do with them? He wept. He wept. And the, the word weeping there, and later on we're going to find out, it's groanings. It's intense pain. It's not just a tear. It's intense sobbing. Have you ever, you ever been there? You ever had this sobbing that comes from your gut, comes from here? You don't even want to eat anything, but you just can't even catch your breath. I mean, kids do that sometimes. You see a little kid. <gasps> yeah, this is the pain that is the, the Greek word is describing. It wasn't Jesus just, you know, wearing sunglasses and just going like, all right, I'm, I'm good, you know, and not show emotion. No, he was out showing his emotion for the person he loved. And so... Jesus weeps, verse 38, and Jesus, it says, he was deeply moved within. The word is groaning. And he came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone was laying by it. The separation that causes the anxiety and the sorrow is the fact that people have nobody to talk to in this world. But Jesus has come to destroy death and the devil, and he will demonstrate his power now. Because he has power over death and over the devil, but he sorrows. And the book of Isaiah says that when the people of God, Isaiah 65, when the people of God were afflicted, God says, I was afflicted. And the Bible says in Isaiah that he engraved us in the palm of his hand, talking about the Messiah and his, his wounds in his hands, you know, and it was in his hands. And um, God suffers with us. God suffers with us. But I would say this, his sorrow is greater than our sorrow. What do you mean? Remember this, all grief is shared by our Savior. All of our grief is shared by our Savior. But we only see one particular grief in our lives. That's us. We see that one. We have that perspective. We can only have that perspective. And there's no more sorrow beyond that. We only have that one sorrow. We can sympathize with others. We can say, brother, I know what you're going through. I felt it myself. But ultimately, we can only really, really narrow down to our sorrow. Jesus knows everybody's sorrows. He bears our sorrow. He was the man of sorrow, and God's heart breaks. He breaks for the, for the sorrow of his people. And so we only see our part in our situation. Jesus sees it all. He sees the pain that, causes, that was caused by sin, 
that leads to death, the power of the devil, how people are stuck in this, how people don't want to get out of it, how people suffer, the, 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 the closet tears. You know what the closet tears are? The ones that only God and you know. He knows them, and he's going to do something about it. Now, it's interesting in verse 38 here. I don't want to get too far out of topic because we've got about 15 minutes. That's it. That's all you're getting today. Boy, might have started a little late today. Um, the word groaning there, or verse 38, or deeply moved within, it's, a, it's an interesting Greek word. It literally, it was used, it was, it was used of, a, of, a, of a horse that was ready for battle. So if you have a horse that's going to go to battle, and the horse, you ever seen these horses that are just like, you know, just, you know, ready to go. Sorry, that was free. That was ready to go, and, and they're, they're, but they're, they're going in. And it's not just like they're spooked or anything like that. It's a horse that is just, right? Imagine that kind of groaning. It, that word is used for battle horses, is used for a warrior ready to go into battle. And a believer, Christian, today, brothers and sisters, why would the New Testament use a word like that for Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus? Why is he being described as, a, as, a, as a, a war horse ready for battle or a warrior ready to enter into a fight? The deep groaning. It's almost like an enemy is present and he's about to destroy it. Who, who is the enemy? What is it? Death, that's right. He's standing in front of a tomb and death just took his beloved friend and he's standing there like a warrior ready to tackle that which his friend, that what took his friend, death. But not just for his friend, for all of us. Jesus is going to show you right now that he has the power to overcome death. What sin produces is death and Jesus has the power to overcome sin and overcome death. And later on, from chapter 11 and on, it's only a few months, and Jesus is going to his death, and he's going to conquer through his cross the power of death and the power of the devil. And this is what we miss sometimes when you're reading the Bible. You're like, why is Jesus groaning? And why is, is he sad? Yes, he's sad, but he's angry. He's angry at what sin has done to his creation. And instead of just laying aside and going, well, you know, this is, this is the way the world is, He's going to change it. He's going to do something about it. He is on a mission to destroy death. This is what makes Christianity unique among all other religions in the world, is that we don't want death. We admit that there's death in this world, but our God is going to eradicate it. He has defeated death, and one day he is going to obliterate death. God doesn't want death. It's like an enemy enter the arena, and God says, oh no, you're going down. And that is death. When death entered the world, who caused death? Sin. Who sinned? Us. Who tempted us? The devil, right? So it goes down the line. Self, sin, Satan, you know, all related. He is going to obliterate Satan. He is going to obliterate sin. And he is going to obliterate death. Now, all in his time. Because right now, through the cross, we have the power over sin. Even though sin exists, you can go outside. And, and see sin, right? See it happen in, your, in the world. I was, I was going to say you can go to your house and find sin, but, you know, that's, 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 that's behind the obvious, right? It's, it's there. You can see it. And sometimes it's in us, and sometimes we hate it because of that. But it's in the world. Did Jesus conquer sin? Yes. Because through the Holy Spirit, all those born-again believers have the power to say no to sin. You can actually sin not in this world. Before, you couldn't. Now we can, through the power of the cross and the resurrection, we do not have to sin. That's the beauty of being born again. You don't have to sin. Before, that's all we did. Now, we don't have to. Why? Jesus. Now, did he conquer the devil? Yes, he did. But he's still roaming around the world? Yes, he is. But he has now lost his power because his power was sin over us. And for the believer, he cannot do it. He cannot have power over us unless we give into it, unless we are willing to participate in that which he says, do it. And we have the flesh still that, you know, it's still on us. It's like, it's like carrying around a corpse, still there. And he can tempt those things so that we can go back into that lifestyle. But we have the power to say no. What about death? Do people die? 
Yeah, Lazarus died. But is it unto death? No, it's unto life. He is going to go on existing. The believer goes on living in the next world. And when the resurrection happens, we will live in this world, in the spiritual world at the same time. Jesus says in verse 34, where did you lay him? And he goes to the tomb and he's told by Martha. It's interesting here. Uh, Jesus said, remove the stone. Verse 39, Martha said, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he has been dead four days. Verse 40, Jesus said, didn't I say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? The Bible says, if you believe, you will see. The world says, I want to see it. Then I'll believe it. But that's not really true. Because so many people have been shown evidence and they still don't see it. (laughs) And they still don't believe it. They see it, but they don't believe it. The Bible says, if you believe that Christ is, he will show you great things. We have to believe him, though. We have to believe what he says. Even though it's not in your hands, faith says it's a certainty that is going to happen, even though it's not in your hands. But it's certain. It is certain. It is certain. And that's what Jesus says. And then in verse 41, remove the stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. That's a wonderful prayer, isn't it? Does any, do any of us pray like that? Not so much. I mean, I'll turn to this side. Does anyone pray like that? <laughs> We have a hard time thinking God hears us, don't we? But Jesus had tremendous faith in his Father, and we have to have tremendous faith in God. Why? We have to know that Jesus hears us. We have to remember that. We have to know, and do we have that confidence? Lord, as I'm praying right now, does he hear you? Well, whether or not you feel it, you know, whether or not you think it is, we have to, you know, the faith in Jesus calls us to know that when we pray, God hears us. And that's a deep thing, isn't it? Because we can be so casual in prayer. Well, what's, we have prayer today, right? You know why people don't come to prayer a majority of the time, if everybody's honest and they're taking census about this? Most Christians don't pray or don't pray together with other Christians because they don't think it works. They don't think it works. We have such less confidence in prayer that when something happens, you know what we do? Hey, this happened to me, <laughs> right? Hey, so-and-so, this happened. Hey, so-and-so, this happened, right? When something happened, do we go to prayer? No, we go to someone, right? Why? We just don't believe prayer is it's really effective or important. And here's one thing Jesus is teaching us, and then we'll get to the end here. And, and of course, he hears us, verse 42. I, knew that you always, I know that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice saying, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who died came forth, bound up, footed with wraps, uh, in wrappings. This is the way they, 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 they wrapped uh, people in the Middle East in the time of Israel. And his face was wrapped around with the cloth. So they would do like a separate cloth wrapping around his head. And his face was wrapped too. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. And therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary saw what he had done and they believed in him. So amazing, the, 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 the response Jesus comes forth, he comes all wrapped up, and the sisters learned that there's love and affection far more than you could imagine. He cares. He bears our burdens, our our, our pain. He bears all of those things. But Jesus of Nazareth has great power. Not only is he great caring, but he has great power. Is it wonderful to know somebody like that? That not only has great power, but he cares greatly for you? It's limitless how much he cares for us. But his power is ba- boundless, too. So it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing person to have in your life. Now, what about the disciples? What did they learn? Okay, we know what the sisters learn. I'll make it quickly. In verses 6 to 10, Jesus tells them that, you know, I'm not gonna, it's, we're going to delay it two days. And it begins to tell them about light and darkness. And the disciples are are concerned because if he goes down to Jerusalem, down where Bethany is, he would be killed. And they don't want to die. And they don't want any danger. So they might have thought, well, this is kind of good that we're not going to Bethany for a couple of days. Let things die down because last time they wanted to kill Jesus, they might kill us too. We don't want to go down there. And they thought Jesus was being too risky if he went down to Bethany. Now, in verse 16, uh, Thomas said, Lord, we're ready to go. Where did it die with you? Now, Thomas was very faithful to God, uh, to Jesus. But even knew he knew that if they went down there, 
it was surely a death sentence because of what the Pharisees wanted to do with Jesus. So these disciples were very concerned to go down to Bethany. That's the background of the story. When the disciples go down to Bethany with Jesus, they're apprehensive that they might not come back. And you can see it by Thomas's words. But this idea of light and darkness is very important for the, for the, uh, the, the disciples to understand. Why was this so important? Not only was Jesus talking about a, a, a light and darkness in the day, that's true, physical, but a spiritual darkness. What's a spiritual darkness? The Pharisees were walking in spiritual darkness, but they had the light. They had Jesus. And so was the, the problem with the leaders is that they had no light, but they had light, Jesus. So they shouldn't be afraid of the darkness. Another thing that was really important for them to understand, this is quite a bit what I think Jesus is saying mostly, is we all have a certain amount of time in our lives. And the Bible illustrates our life like a day. Think of a day. A sunrise is like birth. A sunset is like, day. It's like death. Right? So we all have one day, as it were, in our lives. We only have one life. We have one day. And we're to make the most of it while we have light. Jesus talked about it in John 9. We're to make the most of it while we have the light. And so what Jesus is saying is no matter the problem, no matter the danger, no matter how it looks, we're to never put off what God has called us to do. Why? Because if you put off what God has called you to do, then night is going to come and you're not going to be able to work. You're not going to be able to do it. So while you have the light, take advantage of it. Well, Lord, there's danger. They're going to... Don't worry about it. Your day has been pre-appointed already. Amen. Right? The length of your days. You know how... God knows already how long you're going to live. Even if it's danger, you go down there and if God says it's not time, nothing's going to happen to you. Amen. That's the reality. Even in the most dangerous places. So Jesus is saying, don't avoid it. Remember, they're scared to death of going down to Bethany because of what the persecution that Jesus is going to incur. He said, don't be afraid of it. If God called you to do it, no matter what man tries to do, it's not going to happen. Amen. You're safe. You're good. Just make sure you do it before the sun goes down. Make sure you do it before your life expires. Why? When your life expires, you're not going to be able to do what Jesus called you to do. And that's the sad part about the Christian life. Many, many Christians spend their whole day talking about their life without doing anything for the Lord. Then they get to be about their 80s and 70s and say, well, maybe I should start serving now. And now you can't. It's more difficult. While you have the time, especially young people, right? While you have the time, do everything you can. Don't run away from the danger. Don't run away. Don't evade it. Go to where Jesus is calling you. Well, it might be too dangerous to go. It's scary. It's not if he's with you. It's not if he called you. Don't put it off. And you'll find yourself, you find yourself at night wondering, what happened to my life? If you ask an older person today, he says, what's the, what's the most interesting thing about life that you ever felt? How quickly it goes. How quickly it goes. I can tell you that. I, can, I tell my kids that now. You know, when I was in my 20s, I was like, man, I can't wait to do some more stuff. Now I'm like, slow down. Stop growing. Don't get to be, yeah, no, 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 no. How old are you again? No, 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 no. This can't happen. Why? How quickly life goes, isn't it? And Jesus is talking about it like a day. What, what time is it in your life right now? Is it 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night? Is it 8 o'clock? It's getting there, huh? Work while you have the light. Work while you have the light. Don't, what, if, what if it's dangerous? Don't worry about it. If he's called you to do it, do it. Now, the Bible says never be reckless. And there were times where Jesus separated himself from the danger, right? It's never to say, oh, just go to the worst places in the world and, and have at it. But if Jesus called you there, you know you're going to be safe. You know you're going to be saved. Paul the Apostle did the same thing. He preached, things got hot, then he would leave. Why? He never stayed where it was reckless. He just stayed where God wanted him to do. And so this is an important thing that as we preach and share the gospel, things will get dangerous, but you know what? Work while you have the light. Walk while you have the light. In your day, in your life. It also means about the end times too. As times get darker, we need to work. Well, the light is still here. We have the opportunity to do it here. So um, don't fall back on the things God called you to do. And the disciples had to learn something. You know what? The disciples never forgot this lesson. Just read the book of Acts. They would go to the most dangerous places in the world. Why? Because Jesus told them to do it. And they learned from Jesus here in chapter 11 that no matter the issue, if Jesus called you to do it, that never be afraid. Don't evade it. Don't run away from it. You'll find your greatest blessing 
in the places God's called you, if you don't let fear motivate you to stop it, right? Fear will motivate you to stop any work of the Lord. That's, that's the danger in our lives. It's fear. And the disciples learn from Jesus. What about the religious leaders? Very quickly, the religious leaders. Well, many people came to Jesus because of this miracle. And the Pharisees, they took counsel together. They even had the high priest prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the people. That's interesting, isn't it? He prophesied rightly. They were afraid that if Jesus continued his preaching, the Romans would come in and destroy the temple and destroy their religious system. So they had to kill Jesus. Interesting. He prophesied, even though he was a false guy, completely false, he actually got this thing right. That tells you something about how God uses people. Just because somebody said something right, it doesn't mean themselves are right. If they're false, he said it, Jesus has to die. And he was right. But in, amazingly, in what he said he had to die is exactly what led to the temple being destroyed anyway. Because when they died, when Jesus died, it actually brought forth their rejection, brought the judgment of God upon Jerusalem. And the Romans came and destroyed it. Just what they were afraid of to avoid, it actually happened to them. Now, what about us? What about us? Four things, and I'll let you go. Well, it's not big enough, but I guess it is. Okay, number one, what can we learn from this? This is an important thing. This chapter is an amazing chapter. I encourage you to read it. That's why I struggle with, how am I going to teach this? Because it's so hard to, to really find out exactly what the pinpoint, because there's so many things. Number one, what about us? Not Mary, not Martha, not his disciples, not the religious leaders, you and I. What can we learn from this? First of all, this chapter foreshadows the greatest miracle that's going to happen. Jesus comes out of the grave. Remember how they were saying, oh, no, it's too long, four days. I mean, who comes out of the grave after, after three days? I mean, come on. Nobody, nobody comes out of the grave after three days. Hello? Jesus did, right? It foreshadows the greatest miracle that was going to happen. Jesus is going to come out of the grave, and everybody thought he was dead and done. Everybody thought he was dead and done. The disciples went away. They were sorrowful. Everybody left them. Nobody could believe that Jesus would come back. Well, nobody could believe that Lazarus would come back. He was given us a sign, a guaranteed. Number two, it's a spiritual truth. What's the spiritual truth? When Jesus acted in the world, all his miracles, all his signs pointed to a deep spiritual truth. What's the spiritual truth? Well, if, you're, if he healed the blind, that's like making you see spiritually, right? We're all blind until Jesus gives us eyesight. When he healed the lame, it's like us. We can't walk with Jesus until he touches us. Then we can walk with him. To the deaf... When he opened the ears of the deaf, that's like us. We can't hear the voice of Jesus. Then he calls us. Then we hear him, and then we go, right? So it's all related to a spiritual lesson. What is the spiritual lesson? Well, he physically resurrected. We're going to have a physical resurrection. But more than that, the Bible says when we are in sin, the Bible says it actually calls us dead. We are dead to sin. We are like a corpse. We're dead. Can't hear unless he calls, right? No, he calls everybody, but not everybody responds. But we're all dead. We're all dead into sin until he calls. What happened to Lazarus? He was dead. Who called him? Lazarus, come forth. Jesus did. What does he do? He comes forward. It's a picture of a dead person in sin coming out of the grave and into new life. It's a picture of us. We were all dead in sin until Jesus called us one day, and you came out of the grave. Whatever sin you were in, it was like a tomb. It was dead. It was disgusting. It was horrible. Jesus called us out, and we walk out. And it's interesting. How does he walk out? Remember? Was he like, yeah, man, I'm free in Jesus? No. How does he come out? (laughs) All bound up, right? He can't get, he can't walk really well. He can walk toward Jesus, but he can't. What does Jesus say? It says, Jesus said to them, to those who were around him, you, loosen them up. Take away the bandages. Unwrap them. What is the picture of? All of us come with issues when we get saved. Every single one of us. You know, I look back at my Christian experience. when I was, Oh, man, I was so messed up. And it showed it, right? I actually thought it was, eh, what's wrong? Nothing. I had all these bandages. I hardly walk. But I can hear... And I can respond, but I couldn't walk really well. 
you know, tip over, you know, somebody, somebody had to come and help me up. Somebody had to unwrap me. Somebody had to come and, hey, this is how you walk. All this stuff that you got around, all the stuff you're bound up in, let it go, man. Throw away the dead bandages. You know what's the picture of? Discipleship. We need each other. Somebody has to come in and unwrap you. And if you don't have anybody to come and unwrap you, maybe you're still bound up in things. But that's what Jesus, how Jesus deals with us. Jesus says, calls you, then says to others, unwrap them. Same thing to us. He says, people, sir, uh, somebody becomes a Christian, he tells us, go unwrap them. <laughs> There's still things in his life. He might still be bound up in things. He might still be bound up in, you know, uh, anger or temperament or p- impatience. He might still have ungodly friends. He may still have some things that he is tempted to go back to. So he needs you to unwrap those things. That's how he's supposed to work. Number three, prayer. It's something about prayer in this chapter. What is it about prayer? God delays sometimes. Why does he delay? He wants to show you something greater. He wants to show you something greater and more wonderful than he would have had he answered it right away. That's how prayer works. God delays so that he can show you something greater and something more wonderful than you would have had had he answered it right away. Lord, answer my prayer right now. Oh, he's not. That means something greater and something more wonderful is coming and the revelation of Jesus is going to come to you as he delays. The more he delays, something greater and something wonderful he's going to show you. Do we have the patience to, to wait? Do we have the fortitude to wait? Do we have the, the, the commitment and faith to just keep praying and praying and knocking and seeking, knowing that he will answer? Well, did Jesus pray? Yes, he did. I should neglect it. I should not neglect it either. Did he pray with faith? Absolutely. He said, Father, I know you hear me, and I know that you hear me. So we have to evaluate our prayer life, not you know, everything, sorry, everything, evaluate everything that happens to us through the lenses of the love and the power of God. He's able to do it, but if he delays, he's preparing something rather than giving ourselves a close-up into the circumstance because that's what happens to us. We look at the circumstances up close so much that we go, oh, God is never going to answer this. It's too hard. But here we showed that God was delaying so that the resurrecting power and the exaltation of Jesus will be even greater. And many people believe in Jesus because of it. Now, what about the plot against Jesus? Well, they plotted against him to kill him. Yet the very thing that they were planning on doing was the plan of God. Jesus sent his son to be a sacrifice for us. Jesus sent his son to give his life for us. And the Pharisees were like, we just got to kill him. They're thinking evil. God's thinking This is the plan for my son, and I'm going to turn it around for good. And this is the power and the sovereignty of God that no matter what they plot against Jesus, it was always turned out for the power, for the glory and the power of God, for the gospel. And this is something for us. You know, the world is going to plot against the church. The world is going to plot against believers. The, The kingdoms of this world, the governments of this world will plot against the believers. Believe me, it's happening even as we speak. But every evil deed and every evil word God will actually use it for our good. It's an amazing thing. I don't know how he does it, but I look at the example of Jesus. Whatever they plan against him, it was actually the plan of God. Whatever people have planned against you, it was actually the plan of God. The only thing is, do we perceive it that way? Do we live that way? Or do we go, oh, that's it, man. This is horrible. I can't believe that. I'm going to fight back. I'm going to hit them back. Instead of saying, you know what? If God allowed that thing, that must have something to do with God's plan for me. And I have to embrace that, even if it's evil, even if it's something horrible that they're planning, I know God will turn it around for good, no matter what that is. Did I lose my job because I'm a Christian? Well, God will give you you a better one, or he'll use you somewhere else. Did you lose your family because you're a Christian? Well, you know, Jesus had Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and the disciples. Maybe God's going to give you a bunch of disciples. Maybe God's going to give you somebody like that in your life. But it has to be that we look at the work of God in our lives as completely over everything that the world does. They plotted against Jesus. He doesn't condone what they said. He doesn't condone evil or their sin, but he's powerful enough to overcome their evil. Even if they get things right. Remember I told you about Caiaphas? He got things right, but he didn't intend it for good. God did. He intended it for evil. God intended it for good. And finally, the love and the power of Christ. 
The intention of this chapter is to bring you to this verse. Let's go back to verse 27. Verse 27, we're done. She said to him, maybe you can say it loud with me. And I don't know what translation you have it, but you can, you can, you can say it out loud because it's important to confess it in your own mouth, with your own mouth, this truth. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Nobody else read it with me. All right, let's read it together, right? I meant it. Let's all read it together, right? You guys good? Verse 27, all right. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Do you believe that? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your good news. Oh, it is good news, even in the midst of trouble, even in the midst of darkness and gloom with death. It's the ultimate enemy. Jesus, we see here that you overcame death. You overcame death, the power of sin, and you are the giver of life, and no one can take that from you, Lord. And you are able to turn the evil schemes of men into good news, into the power of the gospel. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, that even in the midst of darkness, he triumphed. And because he triumphed, Lord God, we have the guaranteed to triumph over darkness, over sin, over the devil, over this world. Lord, this chapter is so rich and unique. Lord God, it it would benefit us so much to read it again and to see it in a different light. That Jesus, you are the one who delays at times. You delay your coming. You delay answer to prayer. Why? Because of a greater work that you will do. A greater thing that you want to show us. And Lord, thank you that you're not, we don't believe you're just the the God who is able to do things only sometimes. We believe you are the God who can do things all the time. And there's no power that can thwart you. There's no one that can overtake you. And you are the sovereign God of this universe. Thank you, Lord, that you have that power. But also, Lord, thank you, God, that you are the compassionate Lord, the one that comes to us with tears, the one that comes to us to weep, alongside of us, the one who felt the sorrow and the pain and the death of his loved one, and yet has the power and compassion to deal with us, not only to overcome sin, but to stand with us and to cover our tears and to give us the hope that one day there will be no more tears, the one day that we will not have any more sorrow or pain or suffering, and that guaranteed through the death in the cross, in the power, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for those promises. And we ask you, Lord God, to help us to live it. Because there's one thing to know it, Lord God. But I pray that these things will be in the flesh in our lives. That will be incarnate in us today. So we would go out in the power and presence of your spirit. And be able to have the truth and the love on our lips. And be able to communicate that to those who are perishing, Lord. And there's many who are, Lord. But give us the love and compassion you have, Lord. You came to us, and you deliver the good news, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to deliver the good news to them. And we pray, Lord God, you open the eyes of our families and our loved ones today, and you bring them closer to you. Help us to be witnesses. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We'll sing one final song, and then we'll go right into prayer and right into our Know What You Believe class.